Today is uh, December 12th, I believe, 2018. Uh, I'm here at the Cumberland County Historical Society with Wilbur Wolf, so thank you for coming in today. If I'll, you want to be correct, you can put a junior on that. All right, Wilbur Wolf Jr. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I'll just start off by asking, uh, so where, where did you grow up? Grew up just outside of York, a little farm and outside a little town called Shiloh. Okay. And so were your parents uh, farmers then? My dad was part-time farmer. He worked certain tea, uh, roofing products, and then we had the little 20-acre farm that he farmed on, on the evenings and weekends. Okay. Uh, so, so growing up then, did you help out on the farm? And... Yes, I did. Back in the days when we had mules and horses to do some of the work, so. Uh, and then, um, I know you eventually, uh, when you were a uh, profession, you, you were uh, forced? Yeah, I went to Mont Alto in Penn State, got a degree in forestry, and then I worked after the military. I worked for 28, 29 years as a field forester, you know, doing the things that they do, planting trees, mm -hmm. harvesting timber, advising landowners and how to manage your properties. Well, I, one of the reasons I asked is, how did you get into forestry then? I got, grew up on a farm, wanted an outside job, and that looked like a good one, and, and it worked out very, very well. I, I, couldn't, have, I couldn't have done things that have done it any, had more fun doing a job. It was kind of like I always had a picnic in the woods every day. Yeah, all right. Well, so you, uh, you eventually settled there, in Cumberland County. I'm yeah. wondering why, why, how did you choose the place that you chose? My wife actually chose the place that we moved to, okay. but, but I came to Cumberland County because I had an odd job offer from the Gladfelder Pulpwood Company to come to work at their Carlisle office. We had, we had worked in Virginia for a year and a half, but always wanted to come back home because my folks were in York mm -hmm. and it was, this was an opportunity to come back home and it worked out very well. And how, about how far away were you from your uh, your parents and your family? Well, you're, it was, it's about a 45 minute drive, 30 couple miles. Because I remember uh, your wife Peggy mentioning that they, they helped out quite a bit. Oh, did they ever? <laughs> <laughs> it was a, they came about every other every weekend and helped in, in the early renovation of the farmhouse. And as we did, Peggy, Peggy worked in the house with my mother, my dad, and I worked in the, on the farm putting up fences and doing those kind of things. Hmm. Well, so. Uh, before we uh, started recording, you mentioned that you're kind of uh, just on the, the edge there of the Column de Gwinnett? Yes, sir. All right. So I'm wondering, how did you get involved with the, uh, the Column de Gwinnett Watershed Association? Well, Peg's best friend was, was uh, Betty Sullivan, her husband and Jack, and Betty lived on Sample Bridge Road right, right next to the creek, and, mm -hmm. and their involvement, and she talked, and we, we thought of, they were doing some good things in terms of watershed management, and with my conservation background, I'm always interested in, in making place the place a better place for people in years to come, so it, it worked out well. Well, it, it seems to me that you also had, a, I'm guessing, a perspective related to the agricultural side, or and how that sort Say of... Say that again, please. Did you also have a perspective because of the fact that you were on a farm with the, the agriculture? Yes, or? yeah, and, and, and I was on the Conservation District Board for a period of time, Still am, but it, so I had sort of those two worlds I could bring. I could bring the forestry side of it, which dealt with the mountains mm -hmm. and the farming and the conservation side of good farming practices to help you know, ma manage the watershed more efficiently. Well, so when, when did you uh, first get involved with the, the association? I think it was 1990. Okay. And uh, what's some of the, the work that you, that you did over that time? Well, early on we, we were just, they, they started out with a, a problem with it was American Water Company. I think wanted to withdraw some additional water from the from the creek. So we worked on those kind of projects early. And then when I came on in '96, it was as president. It was during a period of time when they were talking about shad restoration in the in the Susquehanna, and then also up on all the tributary streams. So for a period of time there, we served as the conduit for the removal of dams on the, on the Connor de Gwinnett. Uh, we, were, we were the recipient of grants and then we, and we worked with the contractors and the Fish Commission and all that to take out Good Hope Dam, Black Dam, and then put a, put a bypass around Heisman's Mill 
so that if the shad came up the Susquehanna and wanted to come up the Conway, they could go all the way to the headwaters. And that was a major project for four or five years in there. Uh, so that was that was that was the big thing. And we did we also did some water testing then too. Every Earth Day, we with the con conjunction with the, con the conservation district, we get volunteers and take water samples and bring them there and then and check them against nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and those kind of things. The, uh, the dam removal project that was while you were president. Yes. Well, and, and I guess I was I was sort of in, in that context. I was like the the corporate manager talking to the contractors. Did a lot of did a lot of work with the adjoining landowners. We had to get permission for the contractor to go on the ground. So we we did a lot of work there in that with neighbors in, in the eastern part of the county at that time. Did uh, did a lot of people? I mean, I mean aside from. Uh, Heishman's Mill, did a lot of people have, they, they, it was relatively easy to remove the dam? Or? It was, it, technically, uh, contractually, it was not a big thing, but you were always worried about increasing the sediment flow and those things, so you, you went a little slowly and, and didn't make haste, and then it turned out, to, it worked out better than we had anticipated in terms of downstream sediment flow and things like that. Now, what was the, uh, did you have conversations with Mr. Foshag about the Heishman's Mill? We did, we did, we had conversations with him. He gave us permission for those things to happen. And he was pleased because he wanted to, he wanted to keep his dam in place because mm -hmm. of the way of the appearance of the old mill. And this way, the, if the fish wanted to go around, they could go around the bypass and, and the dam could stay in place. So that was, that was a win-win situation for both parties. Well, one of the questions I had is, uh, how did you find yourself uh, in position to be president of the, of the, uh, the association there? I guess they, they had an election and I got voted in. Yeah. Maybe I opened my mouth many, too many times or something like that. I don't know. And how long did you serve? Uh, six years. Six nine, years? 96 to 2002. Okay. They were, they were, the bylaws stipulated two terms, two three-year terms, and then, then you were on. And then I stayed on the board for, for several, for up to this point, really. Okay. Well, so you, we've been talking a little bit about the, uh, dam removals and the uh, water testing, but is there anything in particular that you're really passionate about, uh, sort of, with your involvement? Well, I think one of the things I thought was, what we were, we as an organization were pa passionate about was trying to share information with the general public. Mm -hmm. We had, we had board meetings and, and membership meetings once a month at that point we were having in the storage center here in Carlisle, and every other month we'd have a public meeting to try to talk about some subject, whether it was conservation practices on the land, what's happening in the water, uh, new regulations, to try to convey that information to the general public so they would know, have a better concept of what's happening in the watershed and what's happening in the conservation community. Well, I mean, that, that gets to a question I had, uh, sort of, how do you feel like the, the importance about, you know, volunteerism and that local civic engagement? Well, there's not enough paid people to get the job done, so you need yeah. volunteers. And, and volunteers come with passion. And when they come with passion, things get done, I won't say more appropriately, but with a better sense of what's happening. You can't, I mean, most people in the business that I was in, the conservation side and forestry, came there because they wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, you get people who are there because they're getting paid to do it. When you get volunteers, they come with, with a passion for getting the job done, and, and it usually works out pretty well. <laughs> Did you find that, you know, when you were doing this local outreach that most people understood where, where, the, where you were coming from? They were, they were open to hearing about it. Okay. Uh, you, know, you know, when you're talking about people who are living in a development along the creek, they bought that because they were they wanted to look at the creek and they wanted mm -hmm. that thing, but they didn't really have a, a most of them didn't have a good working knowledge of the interaction of the the shoreline and the banks and the water and those kind of things. So when you went out and talked to them, they were always they were always open and they always seemed to be appreciative of the information that you were providing. So you mentioned the developments along the creek, but I mean I'm guessing. You know, the other portion of that would have been the, the farmers. Was mm -hmm. that a different conversation? Or? That was a different conversation because there you were talking about their economic mm -hmm. ability. 
uh, one of the things we did during that period of time also, we, we, did, we put in on Mount Rock Spring Creek a streamside buffer down through a man's pasture field as a demonstration area. Mm -hmm. You know, we planted, put up the fence. That's still in existence today. You can drive out there and, and you can see what has happened in the 15 years. The trees are coming up, but there is no sediment getting into the creek as a result of the cows walking on the bank. There's a, there's a stone crossing where they cross the creek, but the rest of that creek is protected. And we did work with Shippensburg University also to put in the same kind of a reclamation thing on a, on a buffer along a meadow down there. Well, this is skipping ahead a little bit, but uh, I know that you've also done a lot of work uh, with the Big Spring School District as you're the board president. And you, I believe you've been board president for a while. Yes. Did you work with the, the local school district at all? Sort of. We had we had some conversation. We had a couple of teachers who were interested in, and they had projects on the school grounds that would would impact in terms of streamside plantings or talking mm -hmm. to the kids, taking them on uh, field trips down to the creek. But uh, no big project in terms of the student body going down to the creek. Okay. So you, you, I think we've talked a little bit about how you know sort of these conservation efforts have improved at least the, the Mount Rock Creek, but I'm wondering how has the, the condition of the, the Conjugunit improved, its health improved or worsened over since 1990? I think we're holding our own. Okay. I don't, I don't know that we can say it's been improved, but it certainly hasn't degraded as, as some streams had. Uh, I think the farming community is much more aware of the impact and the financial impact of putting on too much fertilizer. It's a lose, money lose loss for them, and it's also a negative impact on the creek. So uh, I think that's important. And the Conagwinit is unusual in the sense that the limestone side of the valley doesn't have a lot of tributaries. There are only about three of them that feed the creek. The shale side has multiple streams coming down off the mountain through the shale side. and. Uh, Agriculture has changed somewhat dramatically and you don't have the same number of little farms with four or five cows using that stream for water, for, for their daily water needs and then going back to the barn. So that, that moving away f into crop agriculture, although you say, well, that's not a really good thing, but it is a good thing in that there are not that many animals on each tributary contributing to both the, the manure and the, and the sediment. Now, are you, are you situated on the shale side? No, we're on limestone side. Right. Shale side is north of the creek. Limestone is south. Okay. The middle of the valley is the limestone side. North of the shale side. South side is the sandstone side. <laughs> Trying to, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, it, it makes a difference in what you're doing. Sure. The limestone is the richest soil. Yep. The sandstone is, is, is not as rich, but it's much easier to m maneuver on. Shale is generally a shower of soil and, and okay. less fertile and, and more prone to erosion than the other two. It, and unfortunately, you, you mentioned that's the side that has the, the most tributaries. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, so I imagine, yeah, it's, it's almost like you're dealing with two different creeks. Though. You are, you really, you really are. One side, the practices that are important on one side are different than the practices that are on the other side. <laughs> Trying to keep the yeah. yeah. All right. Well, so I'm wondering how has uh, sort of your involvement with the association sort of affected your life and your family and the lives of the people well, in, the, in the watershed? It, it's affected because we spend some time there, so there's times you're doing other things. But, but it, for me, it's been, I meet a lot of great people. If, <laughs> if you're not into this, you don't understand how many good people that are out there running around trying to do the same thing that you're trying to do. And when you can bring them together in a, in a group, then things happen. Individually, they can, they can have some impact, but as a group, they have a much greater impact. You know, just like the Watershed Association does a number of stream clear, cleanings every year. Mm -hmm. I don't get involved anymore because I'm, I'm past that time of waiting in the creek. Yeah. But this really sort of started when we removed the Good Hope Dam and the water level went down, and all of a sudden you see these things that had been underwater, tires and cans and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that well, was one of the projects that we got involved in right away, cleaning up behind the dam the things that had been, been 
deposited there over the years, and then that sort of led into annual cleanings or semi-annual mm -hmm. stream cleanings. And, you know, things just, once you get started, they sort of fall in place and they, they build on one another. Now, you're also involved, I think you mentioned, with the, is it the Conservation District? Yes, that's correct. So, I, sort of wondering how that, your role with you know, the district sort of plays with your role at the is Watershed Association. Well, by being on the Conservation District, I'm aware of new regulations, aware of new, new processes that might be in place, and then you go to the Watershed Association, you share those things, and you maybe have a public meeting and share them with the general public. So, it's just another way to disseminate information or gather information and come back to the conservation district and say, say, somebody said, this is happening down on the, the West Branch or on the Trindle Run or something like that, to go take a look at it and see if that's good or bad. And then you get, you know, sharing of information is just good. So is the district, is that more of a, like, governmental? It's a, it, the district is run by a private board, but it's, but it's a government agency in the sense that uh, they, they enforce regulations relating to, uh, to the conservation. Primarily, they start off with two, two roles. When development happens, the, the developer who's moving an earth has to have a plan that have, meets government regulations. So they review the plans and then they enforce it. And on the other side, they work with the, with the agriculture community in encouraging them to do best management practices like cover crops or streamside buffers, uh, those kind of things that minimize the impact. Uh, the nutrient flow into the stream. Okay. So I think I, I think the last time I saw you was at the sort of the Watercrest Farm. Yes. Opening, and I think you were speaking there. In your role as the with the conservation. Yeah, we were we were presenting the Central Pennsylvania Conservancy with the yeah. Watershed of the Year award because for their work in in doing just that. You know, if, if somebody doesn't step up and say, okay, we're going to take charges, next thing you know, there's a development there or it continues. And, and that's a really important piece of ground. Yeah. The fact that that's now in, in, in conserved condition with that spring feeding is it's just going to be beneficial to the society long past our time on this earth. Yeah, because I think, well, so one of the, the questions that, you know, we were talking earlier about sort of the impact of, headwaters and the, the various tributaries and sort of the manure you mentioned how that's not healthy for the creek sort of that, that fertilizer runoff and the manure I'm wondering I know that that's a big issue with sort of the, the Chesapeake Bay but do you find it's more effective to talk about the local creek impact or sort of that bigger I think you, I think you talk you, you work at home if you if you okay. make it work at home the impact goes down there and yeah people are aware of the Chesapeake Bay but they're more concerned of what's happening in their backyard or in the neighbor's backyard or three farms away because they can see that. And if, if it's a negative impact on the, either the surface water or the subsurface water, then that comes home and hits them right now. Chesapeake Bay is fine from a national standpoint. A lot of people vacation there, but in terms of everyday life, it's the local thing that gets people's attention. Okay. So I was speaking with uh, Secretary, uh, uh, the DCNR Secretary, Cindy Dunn. Cindy Dunn, a couple of weeks ago. She I knew when she was also Cindy Adams, <laughs> yeah. when she was first there. She mentioned that uh, she, uh, when she helped found the Conangwene Creek Watershed, Watershed Association, that it was with her role with the Chesapeake Bay. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I. I think that, that makes sense then, that, you know, yeah. focus on the local issues to impact that mm -hmm. sort of regional and national. Yeah. Because it, it's easier to get people from the local area to focus on local issues. You know, one of the neat things we did as a watershed association, we took two hikes to the, to the spring that starts the kind of winter up in Horse Valley. Mm -hmm. And that's way in, in Franklin County, up through Roxbury Gap and out and up on top of the mountain is a spring and that's where it starts and flows down through. Mm -hmm. But at that spring location at one time, back in the 1700s, 1800s, there was a big, I'll say a hotel, an inn or something, that was on the route of travel, people coming up from Franklin County over the mountain, down into the into Horse Valley, through the gap at Roxbury, and that was the trade route all the way down to Baltimore and mm -hmm. Philadelphia. So there, in what's now a 
a wilderness in the game lands was at one time a major, I'll call it major, but at least a commercial center sitting up there on top of that mountain at, and using this water out of the spring where the Contra de Gwyneth starts. Mm -hmm. and so we had two hikes up there and it was, it was just interesting to walk up and then kind of look around and there's the spring and there's sort of a stone house and then here's the foundation of this old inn or hotel, whatever you want to call it up there mm -hmm. on, on top of the mountain. Well, it kind of gets to the question, the next question I had, which was um, sort of how, how your work and the work of the association sort of impacts sort of the past, present, and future of the actual creek. Has it impacted? Well, no, uh, yeah, so I, had, how it has impacted. Well, I think by making more people aware of what their impact on the creek will be. Mm -hmm. you, you get them to modify that behavior. And then as a group, they see things that need to be done. So then they go to an organization like ours or, the, or they go to their legislatures, legislators and say, look, this, this is a problem and we need, we need to work on it. And so the more information you spread about it, the more people get involved. And you, you know, you can't, it's not, you can't put too much information out there. People may not want to listen to it, but you can't you can't put too much out. Yeah. Well, then, sort of off the similar vein, there. Sort of, what do you think is the historical significance of watershed protection in Pennsylvania? And uh, the historical the significance of what? Of watershed protection. Well, we we came from a a place where you just assumed the waters were always always going to be there and be good. And so there was not a whole lot being done to, to even think about what the impact of your activities were on the, on the creek uh, to a point where in some places it's over overprotected. So you have to find that middle ground where you can still use the water, but you, you minimize the impact of human activities on the creek itself. And I think, I think any conversation we're having recently is taking into those two sides. How to protect it, but still have it available for human use. Because we need the water. I mean, water is, yeah. we're fortunate in this part of the country. We're not in Arizona or California or someplace mm -hmm. where water just availability is an issue. We have the water, we just have to not abuse it. Well, along those lines, I'm wondering, sort of, what, what, what types of activities do you and your family do? Or maybe, did you of, used to do? <laughs> I used to. I, I fished a little bit, but we didn't. We were not boaters, mm -hmm. and and we didn't go there to swim. But I did. You know, about the only thing I did was fishing on, and uh, and so, so because we're on the side of the where, where there are no streams that come into it, uh, in very very high water, water might have flowed through our farm, through the neighbor's farm, and down into Alexander Spring, and eventually got into the Connecticut but there's, there's no surface flow, it's all subsurface. So I, I can't say that I, I utilize the Conor Gwynedd as a recreational resource very much at all. It's just that it's out there and we, get, we need to pass on something to the next generation that's as good or better as, as we found it. What? How, how close is, is your farm to the, to the creek then? We're, we're, we're a mile from mile and a half from the Mount Rock Spring, and then it's another three miles to the creek. Okay. It's, we're, we're not close in terms, but, but that Mount Rock Spring <coughs> Creek starts there, bubbling up out of the ground, an enormous flow, and then it, down the way it goes, and that's what it is on our side of the valley. So, so you really, for you, it was a lot of just that, that interest in, in the conservation and sort mm -hmm. of rather than having that sort of direct role. That's correct. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> well, you know, telling stories. Yeah. We have on our farm a 90-foot hand dug well, if you can appreciate that. I can't. I mean, I, 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 I would spend enormous amounts of money to see that being constructed. Sure. But local rumor has it that if we dropped straw down our well, which was one of the one of the few wells on the, on the limestone side that the straw would come out Mount Rock Spring and go on down the creek because 
that underground aquifer down there that we tapped in was the same flow that was flowing nine or a hundred feet under the ground and coming out down at Mount Rock Spring. So, you know, that's, that's an old wise tale, but I like to tell it because it, it's, yeah. you know, it, it sort of tells you that under the ground that we're standing on, there's a lot of things happening down there mm -hmm. that, we, that we're not aware of. Well, it's, it, well only just recently they, they figured out where the, uh, Sorry, the uh, the tort? No, the uh, oh. boiling springs. We, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the yeah. water comes from yeah. over on the other side of the mountain somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there's a lot going on that we don't oh, know. Oh, yeah. I would I would love to be involved in dive testing. Putting we don't use that 90 foot well. It's still there, yeah. but we we don't, we don't draw our water from it anymore. But to put some dye down there and see if it really does come out in Mount Rock Spring, <laughs> see it. Yeah. Because I just, the more we know, the better we can make decisions. Mm -hmm. Well, so that was all the questions I had regarding the, uh, the watershed, watershed Association. Is there anything else that you want to mention in particular about no. the group? Or? No, I, I just think it's, over the years, they've been a tremendous group of people to work with, and the things that they've accomplished uh, you know, have been... Well, not bold headlines have had very good effect on the creek and the future of, 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 the, of the watershed. Yeah. And it's been a pleasure to work with all those people. I mean, it's just, you get, you get to know some, so many nice people and you think, if you didn't go out, you wouldn't know. Yeah. All right, yeah. So for everyone, you know, listening and watching, you know, go out and volunteer. Sometimes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> all right. Well, so I, I, I also had some questions, uh, sort of, not, ne not necessarily related to the, uh, the watershed, but just, uh, so you mentioned that you went to the forestry program in Mount Alto. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, how did you find yourself there, and what was that program like? Well, at that point, there was one, it was a one every forestry student mm -hmm. at Penn State went to Mount Alto f for their first year. Uh, we started off with 120 students. And at the end of the year, I think there were 105 of us left. But it was, if you, you know, college kids today, we had 42 hours of class a week. Uh, significant amount of that was lab work. Some of the labs were out in the forest with a, with a crosscut saw, you know, cutting up pulpwood and, and learning that side of the business. Uh, a lot of it was tree identification actually doing some work in the, on, on landscapes to, to learn how to hands-on things, and then followed that with three years at Penn State, and, and then uh, graduated. Had, at, that, at that point in time, every male student at a, state, at a state university had to take ROTC. You were in for two years, you were in well, basic ROTC. Well, then I took the final three years and got a commission in the, mill in the Army, so we spent nearly five years in the Army and then came back and went to work. Well, so why only the, the one year at the Mount Alto campus? Well, that was, that was to, to be the hands-on experience. Okay. You got started there. Originally, the Forest Ranger School was at Mount Alto, and that was, there was, that was back in the early part of the 1900s, and you brought your own horse when you came to school, and, and you learn to do the things in the forest, and it just evolved into the, the, the first year for Penn State. And uh, I was at an interesting time because about 20% of my class were Korean War vets. Mm -hmm. So we had these children like me coming completely out of, out of high school, going there, intermingling with people who had been in a war, and it was just an interesting dynamic in, in the interaction between those two groups. We had, Lots of hands-on stuff. Did other people stay the, the full four years at Mount Alto? No, it, it was only there was there were just 120 students there, okay. and every freshman class came in, and and then they went. The, there were there were two residential halls, a dining hall, and then the cl the big classroom building. But uh, so it was only your class. That was only there. our my class. That's okay. right. And we had talked earlier. You know that was one of those days that they had a they had a, 
rifle team and the rifle team practice in the in the basement of the of the residential hall. There was a, there was a oh a 25 yard 35 yard range in the basement, and that's where we did our practicing. So you were on the, the rifle team. I was on the rifle team there. Yes. Wow. Did you uh, did you compete or was it just the say again please? Did, did the rifle team compete with? Other... Uh, we did, but but not not many. It was you know it was, yeah. it was more an extension of the ROTC program and okay. and well, probably there were a dozen or 15 of us that were but firing 22 rifles in that basement. Yeah. Well then, you, you mentioned you went to State College for yeah. the main campus at Penn State. Yeah. And that's where you met your wife, Peggy? That's my, my and, and I worked in her dining hall. Yeah. <laughs> and she was fortunate enough, I, I was fortunate enough that she smiled at me, put it that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so, well, so, what was the main difference then between Mount Alto and, and the main campus at Penn State? A lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people. You know, a poor old country boy getting dropped down in among twelve thousand students or something like that. It was it was an interesting transition, but the forestry students were sort of their little clicking themselves because we had been to you know, it's not like you go to a state college and you're part of the whatever ag community or whatever. Mm -hmm. You, you know certain people, but we came there as a group because we had been nine months together uh, adapting to college and interacting with one another and learning who was good and who was bad and who you could get along with and who you couldn't. So when we went to Mount Out and we went to Penn State, then that, that group sort of stayed together uh, because most of our classes were together and yeah. you, know, you might have three sections, but you, you were seeing those same people day in and day out. And you got a lot better, I don't say appreciation of, of each other than you do when you're just thrown into, you know, if you, we had just been thrown into Penn State, the, the forestry community wouldn't have been as not close knit as it was. And then, uh, but at the same time, did you have classes with the, the general population as well? Yeah, we did. We probably had half or two thirds of our classes were in the forestry. And then the English classes, some of the math classes, the physics things, were with the general population. And then you were also a waiter in your yeah, various. In the dorm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, back then you could you could work over the summer in a factory, yeah. and 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 work in the, in the uh, the waiter or work at something, and almost keep your pay through cost of college education. Uh, that that opportunity doesn't exist anymore. So. When you completed the ROTC program and were in the, the army for five years, you just well, what was that? What was that like? Or actually, one of the did you complete the ROTC program because you, you were with the Korean War veterans, or did oh, that have an impact? Or I it was, there were there were multiple drivers, I guess, because at that point in time we said it was a draft. And probably half the male population or close to it was being drafted into the service. Okay. Uh, so there was a motivation to finish the ROTC when as a, a commissioned officer rather than getting drafted and, and not having as much control over what you were doing. And at that point in time, they had an ROTC flight training program. So I qualified for that and I learned to fly civilian fixed wing at Penn State knowing that then when I went in the service I would I would be going into Army aviation at some point you had to go to one of the you had to go to armor uh, or infantry or, or, or before you could go to aviation and the aviation was a separate branch now it's a separate branch you could you can go directly to aviation without the other things but I went to armor school first and then into aviation actually I, I graduated on the 6th of June 9th of June I was reporting to Fort Meade mm -hmm. as as a Second lieutenant, not knowing a thing about tanks and having command of a tank platoon, so I had a very good sergeant who kept me out of trouble. Yeah. But then, then I went to basic armor school. After that, it was kind of kind of an interesting transition. <laughs> that's that's why the role of most sergeants, I imagine, is keeping. Them oh, yeah, they, they are very very helpful. All right. So, what was your experience like the the five years that you were in the army? Was it? Well, 
At that point in our history, we were, it was always a period of tension. You never, you never knew when the, we'll say the balloon was going up because we, I finished flight school and we came back to Fort Meade in the spring of 61. And then in September 61, our first daughter was born and we were notified that the whole, our third armored cav regiment was going to pack up, load on ships and go to Germany because the Russians were building a wall around Berlin mm -hmm. and tensions were there and they needed additional troops in Germany. So we went to Germany not knowing whether, okay, that wall's the first step on an invasion. So uh, nothing really happened, but it was always, every morning you kind of woke up and thought, is this the day something that, that somebody's gonna get trigger happy in? So the tensions were tremendous. Uh, and, excuse me, the, the maze of communication. When I was in Germany, I would write a letter to my wife once a week. I mean, there wasn't getting on the cell phone and sending yeah. a message, or I, I just boggles my mind when I see troops in the field, you know, in combat situations, having communication with their, their families back home. Yeah. So there was tension here because they didn't know what was happening in Germany, mm -hmm. and there was tension in Germany because we didn't know what was happening on the other side of the, the East German border, whether somebody was coming or not. Yeah. And we'd have, you'd have alerts, and you know, you'd get up and go to the airfield, and you, you always were hoping it wasn't for real. But if you can imagine, not so much Carlisle, but Newville, say, for instance, and you wake up in the morning and you look down out of your window and here's a row of tanks driving up the road. We had, we had free reign on the German highways. We could run tanks, our whole armor columns up, up and down the roads and sometimes into people's fields for training exercises. You know, it's hard. If you hadn't been there, it's hard to describe it and, yeah. and paint a picture that somebody can really can really think about. Hmm. So you, you mentioned that I mean you had like free reign on this, but did you have, did you have a relationship with the locals in Germany, or was it your well, the, the Germans? You know, it's interesting. We were in '45. We were shooting at each other, yeah. and we got there in '61. It was like we were brothers, hmm. but. Part of that was because they were having to be on the American side of the wall and not on the Russian side of the wall. The, you know, the contrast between what the material goods on the, mm -hmm. on the West German side of the wall and the East German side of the wall were, were indescribable. I mean, it, was, it was like night and day. And you know, we have a lot of people in this country of German heritage. Yeah. And so when we went there, it was kind of like we were, we were going back, moving down the road and seeing some neighbors. Well, we didn't. We didn't. We, we couldn't communicate. I had taken German in high school, so I had a, a rudimentary knowledge of the language, and, and I could communicate some. But uh, we were accepted there without, you know, as friends. And it, as we know, we have. We now have a little girl who was three years old living next to us, who comes to visit us now, still with her with her niece. So we have we have that continuous contact or communication with people from over there. So you, you finished uh, your service in the army then in '66. January '64. '64. Okay. And, and then you came back and you spent a year or two in Virginia. Yeah, I worked for the Virginia Division of Forestry as a forester out of their Abington office. And then you settled in, sort of right outside Newville. Then. Yep. All right. And you said that was mainly just to come back home. Yeah, it was. I yes. I was very happy working in the state of Virginia. If this hadn't been home, we might have stayed in Virginia. Okay. But, it, but it, I had the opportunity to come back and, and go to work for a private company, was, which was a little different than working for the government too. So that, that was a driver in some respects. And then, uh, so you mentioned uh, your wife Peggy was the one that chose the farmhouse. Yes. <laughs> Did that take a little bit of convincing on, on her part? Yes, she did no, but you know, that's a long story. I mean, I don't think it happened, it happened in a- I was gonna say, cause I don't worked out, I mean, it worked out very, very well. Yeah, we put in a lot of work remodeling a house that had been let go for a number of years, and but the kids enjoyed growing up there. And I think, I think it 
built family togetherness to have my folks there with the grandkids growing up. And, and you know, there were a lot of positive things that happened. I don't, very, other than getting tired, that was probably the one negative thing. Yeah. And then, so you actually, you turned it into a, a small working farm. Well, it's, it's, right now it's a 200 acre farm. Yeah. We bought 60 some acres here two years ago. We had 146, so. But I've always had somebody else put the crops out as I was working away. We kept a we kept a cattle herd and do those did those things, but the crop work was always was someone else was doing it for me. Well, then um, I'm just wondering how. So you settled in the Big Spring School District. Uh, you had a couple, a number of kids who were then went to the, the schools. And I'm wondering, but how did you become so actively involved with the, the school district and the school board? Well, we started out in PTO and in our elementary schools mm -hmm. and went to that and then, I don't know, thought there were some things that I thought we could maybe help with in terms of fiscal responsibility and how the district could be run. And I, I thought it was important to have some say as to what my kids would be learning and how we'd be spending the taxpayers' money and it sort of was a snowball rolling downhill from there. Once you got in, you just kind of stuck around. Okay. And when did you first join the school board? I was in the school board first from 81 to 89, and then my job situation changed, and I didn't feel as if I could do the time, so I went off. And then after I retired, I came back on in 97, and I've been back since. I was president from 83 to 89, and I've been president since 99. So, I'm just trying to think back to your kids. So for, the for the most part, though, your kids weren't actively going to school then when you were on the school board. Uh, they were the first bunch. The first, okay. Yeah, yeah. because we guys were in 81, 80, wait, 79, 81, and 83. Yeah. So I was, I was pretty deeply involved then, and well, in 86. So I got to shake hands with several of them as they, as they graduated. Yeah. Then did you have grandkids going too? Or? We have four grandchildren, three of whom have graduated from there. One is still a high school student. And, and I'm looking for maybe some great grandchildren to. to yeah. <laughs> well, I know you had at least one son who was pretty good at wrestling. Yeah. yeah. We did have a state champ. <laughs> so I, I'm just sort of wondering. How is the, the school district, and I'm trying to think when the new high school was built. New high school was built in 90, what, 15, 98, 99. So just after you were- I, I, was, I was on the board when, when that school was built. We, I was, uh, I, let's say I was involved, deeply involved in the acquisition of the, we had talked about, renovating the current high school and, and then the conversation got over, why don't we buy a piece of ground next to the build where we are located and build a new high school that would be much less disruptive and then turn, and turn the old high school into a middle school and do some things. That and that turned out to be a really good course of action. And, uh, and we tried very hard to put up a building that had Minimize maintenance issues, square corners everywhere, and not, and not a lot of fancy. And I think we succeeded in doing that. So we we built that, and then we uh, actually Oak Flat was built. I start when I was on the board the first time. We went through the process of closing Jacksonville and Centerville, but I did I was off when they had finished Oak Flat, the elementary school. But uh, then we consolidated a number of schools. And have now have a, almost a campus, all the buildings within an hour, an hour and a half of each other. Mm. So uh, that's the physical plan. Have you seen sort of anything else change over the course of your time in the school board? Well, we're dealing with state and federally mandated testing, which mm -hmm. sometimes, in my opinion, aren't geared to the things that turn make good citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, 
they're, they're purely academic subjects that, that don't pertain to a lot of the population. We've tried, one of the requirements we have for our kids is they have to take a personal finance course. That's, that's not a state graduation requirement, but that's a graduation for more, so that when they leave that school, they've at least had some talk about savings accounts, interest problems, and those kinds of things, and they don't go blasting into the world. That's something I only learned recently, so I wish I had it at 16, 17, 18. <laughs> yeah, because, and, and we, do some, we do some work with um, a lot of volunteer works, and our school was very, very good about uh, our Tempest Club recognizing and, and with the veterans and doing those kinds of things and having several events a year to, to honor those kinds yeah, of things. I think you just had a, an event recently. Yeah, they had, they had, the breakfast was a week ago. Yeah. And then, then we, we've had annually had a ceremony on Veterans Day to replace the flag on the Randall Sugar Monument out there mm -hmm. and apply a wreath. And, my wife was there, and other people were there. We had that again this year. It was a relatively cold day, and we had the whole high school student body standing on that patio, if you want to call it that, uh, and you could, there was not a word said out of that. They were as quiet and as respectful, and it, it made me so proud to be associated with that group and that group of students, right. as the way the respect they were showing to the, the ceremony that was taking place. Now, you mentioned sort of the, the federally and state mandate test, but I think one of the things that impressed me, and maybe it could be ignorance too, that I didn't have when I went to high school was sort of the, the different tracks. Yeah. There isn't just a uh, you know, general track and college mm -hmm. track, but there seems to be like a business track, an agricultural track. Is that something that? There, there's, that, the that, that, that still does exist to an extent, okay. but it doesn't matter which track you're in, you still have to take those standardized tests. But at least you're, you're sort of working towards a specific goal. Like mm -hmm. if you know you're not going to college, if you're, and you plan on doing something in agriculture, you're taking those specific. Well, we have, we have a, a very strong ag and FFA program at Big Spring, and mm -hmm. of course the Votech exists which all of the, the trades, yep. uh, from masonry to, to hairdressers, mm -hmm. to, uh, and the newest, the greatest one now is, is the health occupations, all the people that are getting training and exposure to those kinds of things that either lead to a job as they come out of school or lead them into a college career that, that has to do with health occupations. So uh, we, do, we, we do a lot of talk about the kinds of things that our community needs as opposed to the kinds of things that some large entity someplace else thinks that the world needs. Yeah, well no, that, that, that was definitely missing from my education. I didn't grow up in Pennsylvania, but you know, it was definitely, you know, here's the, <laughs> it was almost as if they were expecting everyone to, you know, go to college or they weren't really preparing you if you weren't going to college mm -hmm. to get that trade. You know, I don't. I think that we work very hard to expose the kids to all kinds of opportunities, mm -hmm. and I think we're relatively successful. I mean, I don't want to brag, but I think we're relatively successful. Yeah. I think uh, Dr. Fry, who's our superintendent, and I, uh, two years ago, did a program at the Pennsylvania School Board Association annual meeting about our fiscal literacy program and how we require for graduation and. And the response we got from the people there was like sort of, oh, you know, wow, that's such a good idea. But maybe we'll talk to you about getting one in our program because no matter what you do in life, no matter what your job is, if you don't manage your personal finances, yeah. your life is not very pleasant sometimes. Well, yeah, it's the best advice I ever got from my father was, it's not how much you make, it's how much you save, yeah. how much you spend. Yeah. So. I always told my kids, you don't buy anything with interest. Yeah. It, you're better to save for three months and then get it and do without than to buy it now and pay 8, 10, 12 percent interest on the money that you, you borrow. That's what I'm finding now with my student loans. I'm looking at how much I paid in. Like, Stu oh, student loans, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but I'm wondering, was there always that emphasis on sort of the, the personal finance and the, the trades as 
say when you first started back in the I, th I think it's always been there. I think our current superintendent and, and the previous one, Dr. Cowden, were well aware of what the community need or needs and we try to we try to work within the bounds set by the state and federal government, mm -hmm. but then deviate as much as we can to provide what we think our community needs, and that that's important to, to understand. And and we're we're fortunate in that our superintendent grew up in the community, so you know he went to school with our kids, and and he understands that it's it's different from somebody who comes from it comes from someplace else. And, and, and doesn't understand it. Well, I know when I, when I spoke with uh, Peggy, she mentioned that you specifically chose the Big Springs School District because you sort of saw the development in the Cumberland Valley area and Carlisle, and you, you didn't want that for your children. Yeah. You wanted a smaller school. Yeah, well, more opportunities for, yeah. in, a, in a Cumberland Valley, you have X number of students and you don't have the same number of kids able to participate in band or the same number of people that make up the football team. So the opportunities in our district, there are more opportunities for a greater portion, proportion of the student population. And you know, we just like the country anyhow. <laughs> well, one of the reasons I asked is, has the sort of the district, the makeup of the district changed any since you first settled there? Uh, it's still a rural community. The, the, the interesting thing about it is that we are losing student population somewhat because when farmland becomes available, it's being purchased by the Mennonite and Amish families who don't, who don't send children to our school. It still remains a rural community, but, but the, the population has, and has decreased and People aren't having, farm families aren't having as many children as they used to. Uh, all families are not, so without significant development, your student population just normally tails off a little bit. But that's, that's fine too. Then we have, we have smaller classes. We can concentrate more on individual student needs and, and hopefully when the kids go out the door, they're prepared for life in any place they want to go. Yeah. We just had, one of our former English teachers came to the school board Monday night and brought four books to the city. They were books that had been authored by students, English students, or children that she had had as a student who have now gone out in the world and now they have published novels. And you, you think, wow, big spring, no, people writing books, but it, but it, you know, it's, it worked out and it was, that's pretty impressive in my mind. I mean, I don't know how many of us, you know, go around and say, well, we have, in the last 15 years, we have three people who came out of here and, and now they're published authors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially, as you mentioned, with, you know, it's, it's the population isn't as big as some of these yeah. other school districts. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, I'm trying to think, I, that, that, for the most part, that's everything that I had. Actually, no, I did want to ask, so you, you worked for the, the private company, Yes. I, I'm wondering if you could just sort of speak about what, what that job entailed. Say it again, please. So your work uh, with the, the pre it was a paper company? It was, yeah, it was, it was the, the land holding and, and wood purchasing part of the, what was the Gladfelder paper company in Spring Grove. And I'm just sort of, what, what did that, you mentioned that it was kind of like a picnic every day. Yeah. Because you got to eat out in the woods, but sort of what did the, the job entail? Well, the, okay. Uh, the uh, it was all encompassing. We bought land, mm -hmm. uh, so I was involved in the, in the appraisal of land before purchase. I was involved in the surveying of the boundaries. Sometimes uh, we bought farms with houses on them, and we would then survey the lot off and sell them as a hunting camp and things. Uh, so I was involved in that part. I where I was involved at the courthouse and researching deeds, looking up chains of title. Um, after the ground was purchased, we were primarily interested in planting conifer trees because that was the short supply. There was plenty of hardwood. The, the leafy trees were there. Mm -hmm. So we, I was involved in then the decision on what trees to plant, supervising the planting, supervising the care. 
uh, went from that to uh, looking at the, the hardwood stands that, and organizing the harvesting, deciding what trees to be cut, what trees to be retained, where to build roads, how to build roads, where to put in bridges across creeks. I mean, I think about what we could do then as compared to what we can do now. Uh, we were two, two projects, one in southern Fulton County and one in central Huntington County, where we went in and put a head wall up and put a bridge across, 40-foot bridge across the creek with no permits, <laughs> you know, and, and all those kinds. I mean, we just did it and did it. Uh, and I, I just, I it was in the golden age of forestry, you might say. And the other, the other thing was very interesting at that point in time. I mean, I was doing just like a state forester was on the state land. I was managing the land. Yep. And uh, at that point in time, it seemed like the state foresters, the federal foresters, the private foresters were all talking about conservation, all talking about reestablishing forests, all talking about properly managing forests for the production of, of wood products. And we were all going in the same direction. And then, so that was for me was the golden age. We, sure. we all we all going the same way. Now it's a little different thing. The, most of the paper companies have sold their land. Uh, it became a well. When you think about, it, we bought land for fifty dollars an acre, mm -hmm. which you know, and now that same land is worth three or four thousand. The econ economics of of keeping it became better. But gosh, was it fun? Yeah, I mean it was fun. I mean I met, and you met people who. We're out there working every day and you say, well, you know, they didn't go to high school, they didn't go to college, but they're running a the business. They're, 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 they're making a product, they're shipping products 200 miles down the road. Uh, and they're working, working hard. Uh, one of my favorite tales is a, uh, a lady, uh, Mrs. Summers, she and her husband were loggers. I mean, they, they had a business. Their son actually ended up in the business afterwards, but they were just the two of them that would come in. They had a skidder and a truck and everything, and she broke her leg. And so I go to visit them on, in the woods, and she's there with a crutch and a chainsaw, and she'd take the crutch and the, get over to the logs, put the, log, the crutch down, start up the log, cut up the logs and take the crutch and go back and walk back to the trucker with her. I'm thinking, my, you know, how many people are gonna do that today? Yeah. But, but she, she said she, she knew she had the job to do it. There wasn't anybody else gonna do it if she didn't do it. And I can still visualize her going across that yard during the day with the under, crutch under her arm and the chainsaw in her hand. And that's the kind of people you met. And you, yeah. you think, how do you live up to their expectations? I mean, here, I'm just walking around with saying which trees to cut. Yeah, no, but it's interesting that even the, the private companies were still, they were focused on conservation, yeah. even, you know, balancing that with making a profit. Yeah. I, when, I, when I got done with the, if I was going into a timber harvesting job, my thought was, what's this going to look like 20 years from now? If, what, am I, what am I going to do to say that the next person that comes to manage this is going to have a better piece of ground than, than, than I had when I walked in here? Because we were, you know, the stuff that we were dealing with was stuff, a result of activities that happened in the early part of the century. And, well, they were doing what they knew how to do, but, but there was no thought to long-term yeah. impacts. Yeah, it's like it's going back to that personal finance stuff. Yeah. Make long-term investments and it pays yeah. off. But you, you know, you saw a lot of th funny things in the woods. I'm, again, I'm running at the mouth. I understand that. No, no. But, but um, one piece of ground we bought up in Huntington County, Trophy Valley. Uh, I'm walking along the top of this mountain ridge, and all of a sudden, I'm, I, ch I noticed that something changed. This is not the same forest that I was walking in. Mm -hmm. And so I go to talk to the neighbors, and oh, they said, yeah. Forty years ago, they had a peach orchard up there on the top of the mountain, and this little three or four acre block was the peach orchard. And, and I said, why? Well, because that was the way, if it was down in the valley, it would get frost on it, and the blossoms would die, and it wouldn't get peaches, so they put it up on the side of the mountain, so it, it didn't bloom as quick as, but when you walked up the ridge, it came, it was just like you cut a line, and this is not the same thing I was walking in. Sure. 
Yes, sir. So you see things like that. You just, you know, one of the wonderful things you see in life. There was most of your work outside Cumberland County then too? Or? Yeah, most of it was out. We didn't, we only had one tract of land in Cumberland County, out on North Mountain, but I worked in Huntington, Juniata, Perry, and Snyder, hmm. and Fulton counties. So those were the more rural areas? Yeah, that was just the arc around. The, the, they, were, they were counties, again, uh, where agriculture was going out of existence because the fields weren't fertile enough. They were smaller pieces of ground, and uh, I like say, Hundred dollars an acre was a lot. Was a high price for land. Yeah. If we paid a hundred dollars an acre, we thought, "Wow, we've gone, we've gone over." This was a. I started there in '66. No, '65, excuse me, and worked up to '93. And but during that period of '66 to '75, when we were buying most of that ground, it was. You know, of course, the land in Cumberland County was only about two hundred dollars an acre. So. Yeah. It's hard, uh, hard for to think about it when you yeah. think about the prices now. Yeah. Well, yeah, inflation, all that fun stuff. Yeah. So. All right. Well, that's all I had. So, okay. is, there, is there anything else you want to mention, or no? We'll just run at the mouth. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I enjoy it. So. Okay. Thank you so much for coming today. Okay.